Hi, Lynn Hunter here, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. Um, I am a storyboard artist for animation and an illustrator, and we're continuing on today. This is my holiday card for this year. Um, I do a secular holiday card, uh, usually with a child from a different culture, playing a musical instrument, um, and enchanting dragons. And this is um, um, a little boy who is um, one of my best friend's son, and his name is Flynn. And this is Flynn. And I'm using him as the main model for this piece. Um, basically today we're going to be doing pen and ink. Um, the type of pen and ink we're doing is ballpoint pen. And ballpoint pen gets kind of a, um, how shall I say, a negative um, attitude towards it because it's a common everyday tool. Um, it's not as permanent as uh, India ink because India ink has pigment in it and it's um, basically got a lacquer in it and it will last for just about ever. The India ink will last as long as the paper will. Ballpoint pen is a little bit more fugitive. If you stick it in sunlight for a long time, it will begin to fade. Um, however, it's pretty dang tough. Um, that's why we use it in um, um, checks and, and permanent documents because it's tough to get rid of. It's, it's an oil-based um, pigment, or it's an oil-based medium, I'm sorry, that has some pigment in it and it lasts a long time. It's also water resistant. So it's really good as an underbase for watercolor. Um, I like it because it has a special personality to it. Just as pencil has a personality to it, ballpoint pen has a personality to it. And just because we use it as an everyday drawing tool um, doesn't mean that there aren't ways that you should learn how to use it. Just like pencil. We've used pencil ever since we were kids. So why would you need to know how to draw with pencil? It's kind of the same thing with inking with ballpoint. It has tricky qualities to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a couple of the pens I like. And then we're going to get going on pieces of this composition. And I will show you what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, cut the video into smaller pieces because this particular piece, this is a good sized piece. This piece is about, um, uh, the, the size on it is 12 by 16. So it's about a foot by a, almost a foot and a half. And so the thing is, is that this piece is going to take at least me probably anywhere from three to four hours to ink because I'm going to do some detail inking on it. So what I want to do is I'm going to introduce you to the tools. We're going to do um, some detailed pieces on the piece and then I'll show it to you when I'm done. Hopefully the, this um, video won't take more than um, 30 minutes to an hour because I want to introduce you to techniques and the medium, but I don't want you to have to sit and watch the entire video. So, um, I, I know I, that's not quite what I want to say. Um, but anyways, we're going to get going on this. Um, this is one of my all time favorite tools. This is a zebra, um, F one Oh three. And they put a BP here for like ballpoint and it's 0.7 millimeters and the F means fine. This does come in a medium point as well. Um, I like it because it's got a stainless steel um, barrel and it's got um, a plastic grip at the end. But um, zebra pens, um, you can also replace the uh, pen after you've used up the ink. Um, you can replace the barrel inside so it's not a total throwaway pen. But zebra pens are really nice and I like them and they come from Japan. And you can usually get them at a Staples. Um, um, most, uh, sometimes the drug stores will sell zebra. It's a pretty common pen. Um, if all else fails, one of my favorite places on the internet to buy pens is called Jet Pen. 
Um, they're just, if you want marvelous pens from Japan and the Japanese make some amazing um, stationery. Um, give Jet Pens a try. Um, they're not paying me or anything. They're just one of my favorite places to use. But anyways, that's this is a Zebra um, F301. And like I said, I like that one a lot. Um, these are two of my other favorites. These are Bic Sticks. Um, this one's a fine point. This is your standard Bic ballpoint pen. Fine point. Um, and this one is your standard crystal clear Bic Stick. And believe it or not, this is an art tool. This is a good art tool. It all depends on what you want to use your tools for. But anyways, I really like the big stick. And I will use um, all three of these while I'm working on this particular drawing, primarily because, um, especially on this paper, this is cold press watercolor paper. It has a little bit of tooth to it. If I were using um, uh, uh, hot press paper, I'm more likely to use almost exclusively my big stick with medium point. Um, because this is um, got some tooth to it, I'll sometimes I'll go between all three of these um, depending on what I want to do. So while I'm doing this, you'll see me, I may or may not interchange between those three pens. And of course, this is my Tombow. This is a 0.5 um, mechanical pencil. You can, any holder for a mechanical pencil is fine. Um, I like um, 0.5, it's um, for a finer line. 0.7 I like to use a lot as well. And again, you can get them anywhere. This, is, this particular holder is just, it's a nice mechanical holder. It all depends on how you like the weight of your tool. The Tombow has a little bit of a heavier weight. I like a little bit of a heavier weight um, to my pencil. So that's what that is. And, okay, we're going to start on the head of this one particular dragon right here. And you'll know um, the uh, pencil is a little bit smeary. And that's okay because it's all going to be covered up by paint later. Um, even with watercolor it will either wash away or cover up a lot of what you've done in pencil. Um, if you want the pencil to come through, sometimes a harder pencil is better to use if you're um, going to start a watercolor, do the watercolor with its base and pencil. What I'm going to use right now um, is, this is the, the um, F103. Uh, zebra van. Now, before I'm starting to draw, I'm going to wipe the um, pen on a paper towel, and I'll also use, um, sometimes I'll slide the pen um, over. I keep a, a pad of post-its or note, notepad or a piece of paper nearby for um, just drawing the pen on the pen to clear up the ball, because it's got a ball tip, right? And the ink will have a tendency to bunch up on the ball. Um, I see, like, um, on this particular, let's see here, let's see, my camera will focus on it. I put this in here. Will it focus? No, it won't focus. There we go. Okay, you'll see that, that some of the ink there is right there. You can even see a little hair there where the ink has glopped up on the tip. Now, if you draw on that right now, it's going to blop on your uh, drawing. And sometimes I like those blobs um, because they act like punctuation marks and um, they kind of give a place for the eye to stop. So I don't mind them sometimes, but for the most part, I want to keep my drawing smooth and I want, I want, to, be con I want to control where those globs go. And if for some reason you do get one of those blobs, um, as we go on, I'll, I'll show you how to fix that, how you can quote unquote erase ink. I don't care if it's India ink. I don't care if it's ballpoint pen ink. If you're working on good paper and we're working on good paper and what I'll do is I'll just roll that pen on my paper towel. And another thing I'll do is if you can see, I'll take it and I'll roll the side to get that glop off the edge of the pen and get it cleaned up again. So that's why you, um, 
take my piece of paper off here. Um, that's why you want to occasionally keep um, extra scrap paper around while you're working on it. Also, um, I like to use a small post notepad to, um, just to go underneath my hand while I'm working. I'm really bad about smearing things. Um, I have a tendency to be messy at times. Um, like I said, I've said before, it doesn't seem to affect all that badly uh, the final work because it's it's the final work that that's the most important. So if you make mistakes while you're doing the piece, as long as you know how to clean up your mistakes, that's what's important. So we're going to start out with this 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 particular dragon first. We're going to start off with this eye. I have a tendency to draw like I'm carving. Um, I'm I don't have a real sure hand per se. Um, at least I don't feel I do. I mean, it's like, um, as with all artists, we all have a tendency to be um, self-deprecating <laughs> is the word. We put ourselves down. I don't know what it is about us, but most most artists that I know have a little bit of an inferiority, inferiority complex. And we all, all think that, you know, we will never get to the place that we want to be or be as talented or brilliant or you know be able to draw as as well as the heroes in our lives do so that um we we have a tendency to to put ourselves down so my apologies with my own deprecation but that's kind of what I do um but like I said I know very few artists who you know don't think they're both the best and the worst thing on the face of the planet now what I'm doing right now is I'm giving um, kind of some scales to this guy. I started. I'm starting out with a. I said I was going to start out with a zebra, and I'm starting out with a big. Uh, but I'm giving him um, almost. Um, these are kind of um, gazelle-like horns. Now the thing is, is that when you're when you're creating, I'm going to pull out the zebra now. For the heck of it, I'm going to see which, which pen do I like today, which pen works best. It's been a while since I've worked on um, the uh, cold press because I normally work on um, a lot of, let me, let me just back this out a little bit so you can see the horn I'm working on. There we go. There we go. So you can see, see the horn better. Okay. But um, I like hot press quite a bit. Um, I like the, the, um, you get more foxing in your watercolor. There are more like um, tendrils that the paint leaves behind and funny um, quirky textures that it leaves behind if you use hot press. The cold press has a tendency to leave behind um, a smoother quality, even though the, the, the paper itself is um, bumpier. Um, so you can see right now I'm get, getting, excuse me for changing subject here again, but um, I'm getting a very, very thin line here. These are both fine line pens, so I'm getting a thin line here. And I'm thinking, I'd like it a little bit thicker, actually. So I'm pulling out, I, I, I wa did that off screen, I'm sorry. Um, I'm wiping off, this is um, big stick again. Um, and again, so you can see, um, I'm trying to get the globs off the edge of the ball first before I start drawing at it. Now, as you draw, draw with a pen, that glob of ink that comes on ballpoint pens will build up behind the ball and you might get a glob where you don't want it occasionally. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Um, medium pen for medium pen is pretty thin, even on, there we go. I'm going to put some detail across his horns. And what I have a tendency to do when I am drawing is I will go back and forth with things. I will um, do details and then I'll do um, continue to work on, a piece, on the non-detailed portions. And then I'll go back to the detail and I'll go back and forth and wander around. Um, and I'll, I'll, it's very much like carving wood or um, 
you kind of feel with your eyes. It's something I, I've noticed, um, if you can imagine how things feel, it's like touching with your eyes. And it's almost like sculpting when you are drawing. And I'm putting this nice little frill around him and following the edge. And you'll, what I'll do is, the nice thing about bullet, ballpoint pen is that it, if you draw lightly, you can see it's got a little bit of a, um, almost a pencil quality to it. And as you press heavier, you'll get a darker line. So you get a, so you get a variance in line. Whereas if you're working with um, India ink, it just goes down black. You just get a line and that's it. With ballpoint, you get a little bit of variance in your value. So it's kind of like pencil in that way, where pencil is the same thing. If you press down hard with a pencil, you'll get a darker line. And as you lighten up, you'll get a lighter line. And that's another reason why I probably um, really like ballpoint. Um, it was funny because in grade school, it was one of those tools where you weren't supposed to do anything in pen. You're supposed to do everything in pencil, at least when I was growing up. And so it was the illegal tool to use. You only use ballpoint for when you were turning in a final paper in writing or something like that. It's the only time you were allowed to use ballpoint pen where I went to school. So um, it wasn't until college that I started using it as a sketching tool in my sketchbooks. My first sketchbook, I didn't really have a real honest to God sketchbook until I was 18, um, which is probably why I love sketchbooks so much because um, until then it was like pieces of paper. I would get pads of white paper that I'd steal from my dad. Um, he would get these pads of paper that would say from the desk of Donald W. Glass. Yeah, that was my um, maiden name. And um, I would steal his pads because they were these marvelous, like five by eight and a half, five inches by eight and a half sheets all bound together like books. And I would steal his pads and my father would yell at the top of his lungs, who's been stealing all my paper? And I'd be, I'd be down in the basement just cowering, hoping he didn't find out that I stole his pads of paper. Okay, now this dragon I'm giving him pretty even teeth. I have no idea what said in my mind to give him even teeth. These are more, almost like alligator teeth. If you ever take a look at an alligator, they have real even teeth. And I started saying this, when you're, when you're um, um, creating imaginary animals, it's good if you know something about animals in general. Um, one of the things I do a lot of in my sketchbook is just draw animals. Um, you know, pick an animal out of the day um, to go online and just pick an animal, uh, say, um, cow and you'll find a hundred cows come up and pick a couple cows to draw and draw them from different angles and those cows can end up being in your artwork okay so we got a pretty good dragon going there i'm going to give him a little bit more detailing in his face and i'm going to we're going to go do some of his neck and then I'm going to um, spend some time at, at a different part of the, the painting. And I'm going to be giving, you notice I'm starting on his back here. I'm giving him a really uneven and bumpy ruffle on his, uh, his scale on the back there. But I'm, I think I'm going to give him fish. We're going to give him fish-like veining. And with a fish, if you ever, again, another thing you can look up online, just um, do something like Google tropical fish and then, or tropical fish fins. And just, you've got all that reference there on the internet. I mean, you can find anything. You wanna draw castles. You wanna draw, um, oh, automobiles, I mean, say Model T and all of a sudden you've got 50 million images of Model T come up 
um, when I first draw, drew as a kid, I mean, I had so little reference. And when, um, when I wanted to check out reference, they wouldn't let you check out the books that had all the photographs in them in the library. Those had to stay in the library. But um, you've got you have so many opportunities, use them. Um, there's so much that, that you have for reference that you can use on the internet now. But anyways, right now I'm giving him like fish-like veins, which would just be just little lines you can tell. I'm drawing down. And again, see where I'm heavying up the line on the edge because I want more of an outline there. And I'm just, this is going to be like little details. So that's why I'm keeping a nice and light there along the edge. Now, for his, under his neck, we're going to give him a little bit of a snake-like look. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, not sure what I want to do with the neck, but I want to keep it more mathematically correct. So I'm going to take my pencil here. I'm drawing in the pencil first. And I'm going to... Um, do diagonal lines here and I'm trying to keep them equal spacing and um, again uh, I've, I've done some um, videos on um, learning how to judge spacing but one of the things this is a good way to practice try to keep the spacing between things similar it's not necessary you don't have to do it these could all be different spaces but um, there's pattern in nature. Um, learning pattern is another good thing to do because pattern is everywhere. Um, nature is full of pattern. Think about when you look at an oak tree, all the leaves are similar and different at the same time, but that similarity, that pattern in the leaves, no two leaves are the same, but there's something about them that is all the same as well. And so pattern is very, very important when you're creating design or illustration is sometimes is trying to get that ability to look um, similar and different at the same time. Okay, so we've set up this um, almost, um, how shall I say, um, uh, barber pole type pattern. Now we're going to go on the other direction. I want him to have, or him, he, she, it, um, I'm going to put through another diagonal. I want these to be diamond shaped. So I'm throwing a long curve across this along the edge of here to give it more of a diamond shape to the scales that I'm doing here. I want, like I said, I want more of a diamond shape. So I'm throwing that and it's getting more, it's, it's more diamond up here. The longer the line is, the more diamond it looks. And the shorter it is, the more square. So I'm throwing, throwing a little bit more of a length to that diagonal. And this way, you can tell I've got this feeling of form going around without... Um, actually putting anything circular just by getting that diamond pattern by throwing that arc okay um and that is the beginning of the scales now that's a little bit heavy to draw on top of so i'm going to ghost it with well, this is what i call ghosting back i'm taking my kneaded eraser and i'm just wiping it carefully not not real hard just enough to take away the top layer of that um, graphite away and I'm gonna come back because I want again I want this to be like a belly portion but I wanted the the um, lines to come in and I want I'm trying to think let's see there there yeah because I want an overlap of where the scales are okay and what I'm going to do, instead of drawing each of those lines, I'm kind of circling those diamonds. And that'll give more of a feel of a snake scale. If you ever look at a snake, 
they have that this diamond pattern to them but they're really they look kind of ovally like eggs where one runs into another so I'm just kind of doing a, a circular almost egg-like shape where each of those diamonds were because I want I, I don't want it if if I drew each of those lines flat in it would feel more of it have would have more of a mechanical feel to it or an artificial feel to it and by drawing um, these little ovals within the portion of the diamond that I created by doing those diagonals um, it's going to be give it a little bit more of a natural feel it'll still have that snaky feel I still have scales I still have this pattern of a plaid but it it's not as and I can even throw a little bit of that diagonal in so I'm just giving it ends up having more of a, of a leathery feel to it and then I'm gonna throw the underbelly straight across from those diagonal lines that we drew and then I'm going to take outside and I'll do an overlap so you take take it a little bit under under the last piece and pull up and under and pull up and under and pull up and under and pull up and it, it ends up being kind of like braiding or um, and you get a nice um, reptilian feel to that neck okay the next portion of this that we're going to work on is um, Flynn himself and this is our man Flynn get his button or handsome as a button as you'd hit. Um, I got this sleeve, I feel a little bit too large. And I'm going to um, ghost this all back a bit. I've got my general idea of where I want everything. So I'm ghosting back the drawing again. Um, when your uh, kneaded eraser gets too full of graphite, you just do this pull it apart, put it together, pull it apart, put it together. It's like silly putty. Um, when it gets so full of graphite that it's black, it's time to throw it out and get a new piece. I usually get um, a larger, you can get them in, in various sizes of blocks of it. Uh, if you say buy from Blick or buy from an online art supply store. And um, let's see here. I want to... Um, get Flynn more on the money first here. He's close. He's very close. But uh, I want to get him just a little bit more. And he's, he's looking up at um, this dragon up here. But uh, that's a cute little nose. Likenesses are always a challenge. And the more you do them, the better you get at them. Um, what I would recommend, if you want to improve your ability to get people's likenesses, find your favorite um, actor or actress on in the internet and work on drawing them over and over in different ways. Don't use the same person. Um, and just use them as practice that way you might have or do it do ones that, that maybe your friends like so you can give them away as gifts 
um, you know, just uh, get separate sheets of paper, do a likeness when you get close, give it away, do another one. And then that way, not only are you um, practicing more on what you would like um, or what you think your friends might like, um, you're getting better at drawing and you get to give away gifts at the same time. But you've got all that that, you know, all you have to do is Google your favorite actor um, on the internet and ta-da, your likeness is good. And another one that, that that's, I find kind of difficult is uh, doing smiles, getting smiles right, and getting teeth right in the right place. Um, that's always a difficult thing to do. Need a little bit. Let's see here. This here is going this way. He's got a nice, he's got his cheeks up here, and he's got a little bit of a, a square jaw. He's got a very egg-shaped face, which is nice. He's got a simple, basic face. There we go. That's him right there. Okay, now that's my my basic idea of Lynn right now, and so I'm gonna. I've got his proportions, and it's it's where you're getting your proportions is where you get the likeness coming from. Once you get the proportions down, where the eyes are, where the nose is, how big the nose is, the sh shape of the face, that is a big important one. Is the shape of the face the shape of the eyes, um, the express, overall expression. He's, he's got these marvelous little round teardrop like eyes and he's got good straight brows. So his brows are right on top there and a very button nose. It's his age. <laughs> that the noses will will change quite a bit as as kids get older. That's when your nose starts developing around high school, actually. And what you would do with the, make a smile work is you bring the corner of the teeth in. They don't go all the way to the edge. The edge has got a shadow in here, right here and here at the corners. When you've got a smile, there is a, a, a dark spot right there where the corner meets the cheek. And then a t you'll see the tongue. And when you're smiling, you won't always see the lower teeth. You'll always see the upper teeth. You won't always see the lower teeth. And what I will do is if, when I'm painting this, if I paint color over it, I'll come in with um, an X-Acto knife and get, pull out the teeth, pull out the white of the teeth um, after I've uh, completed the painting to get the white to pull out. And I'll sometimes do that with the whites of the eyes too. When you wanna get the whites of the eyes, when you wanna get that highlight in an eye, you can you can pull it out with an exacto knife and that's why you want to use good you always want to use good paper the paper you want to use you want to use at least what's called 140 pound or 300 gram paper to get your um, your ability to be able to make corrections because you can always um, 
use an exacto knife to pull out mistakes if you've got good heavyweight paper and it's the same thing with with bristol as well if you've got a good bristol and you're using pen and ink you can always correct mistakes with an exacto knife if you've got good paper that's why it's like if you're going to invest in anything if you're you're doing any kind of work on paper invest in some good paper because your substrate is everything there we go methinks we have Glenda we go there's our our drummer boy and I'm gonna I'm giving him um, let's see here I'm gonna use my big stick again now I was using the um, more slender and fine point for, for getting making sure that I got everything on the face and I'm coming back in with my my big stick again for Getting the acid, but you see, it's like it's still, even though this is a medium point, it's still got a lot of um, um, it still has a fine point capability. And again, it's about how hard or weak you're pressing the pen. Now, on this, um, his sleeve over here, I got that sleeve sticking out too far. I wanted it to bring more, yeah, there it is, right there. That's where it needs to be. He's got to bring his shoulder up just a little more here. And then I'm putting um, an inner detail here. And I want the, uh, the, um, the strap that holds up the drum going around there. are working you know a lot of times there's sometimes I'll, I'll have I'll do a, a rough where you know nothing seems to work and everything's going wrong and and you'll work it and work it and work it and it's like you feel like oh geez I put so much work into this and it's just not working and sometimes at that point it's worth saying number one step back from it if you've got something that just isn't working and you're really frustrated with it step back just just go and do something else for a little bit and then come back to your drawing because sometimes no matter what you do um it isn't the drawing it's your brain your mindset how you're feeling that'll make or break your drawing and it's worth okay i'm going to step away from this a while and come back to it okay so now i'm, I'm going to go back to his arm. Okay. And I want, let's see here, how do I want that feather? I keep on, I'm, I want to give him a feather. I want to give him, you know, some, some, actually, let's give him a couple of feathers. There we go. Maybe give him a, there we go. Maybe a couple of feathers that are drifting back here behind the hand. Thing is, we're going to have a hand here. His hand's here going to be holding the drumstick. And I'm just not, it's like, I don't want to put too much in there. But I, that's what I'm thinking. Maybe just throw um, like a, a pheasant feather. You guys have ever seen pheasant feathers? My mom used to get, um, pelts of pheasant feathers um, she was a um, craftswoman who made seashell and silver jewelry and she would get 
she did some feather jewelry as well. She would make feather earrings. This is the 70s, so that was something very popular back in the 70s were feathers. And she could get pelts of pheasant feathers. And there's nothing like if you've never seen some of the domestic pheasants that come out of China. <gasps> oh my lord, some of the Chinese pheasants are just spectacular. And I remember she got a, a, I got to keep one of the pheasant pelts from one of the emperor pheasants, which were just gorgeous. And, and that's the thing that, that um, they used to put there in their hats in the Renaissance, like I said um, previously, that um, ostrich feathers from Africa had just become very popular. And um, people in the Renaissance would put the marvelous ostrich feathers in their hats. And that was very luxurious and wealthy. And there used to be um, taxes. They would tax people. You could only, only people of a certain level could, could wear certain types of jewels. Now again, see, here I do, oh, not being conscientious. And I've smeared all this pencil here. But again... This is all going to be erased away. Um, now, seeing the dragon here, he's he's dried enough now. I can erase away all the pencil that I put in that dragon, and that's what I'm going to do over here. So it's like I have smeared all this pencil here. Not a big deal. Once we we do the pen work, um, th this pencil can all be erased away, and you won't even see it underneath the painting. Okay, we're going to work a little bit more on um, the costume here. Um, I want to show you again what, where um, some of my stuff's come from. This is, um, basically, this is um, reference material that I've picked up from the internet. And I put it down on um, a single sheet of paper for myself to look at to give me ideas um, for what I wanted to do um, for... The costume that I'm I'm putting Flynn in. I wanted it to be more of a, a British costume because um, I was trying to do um, <laughs> Renaissance British, and it's coming out more Ren Renaissance Lands Neck um, because uh, Flynn's got a wonderful Irish name, and um, he's got a British background as a kid. Um, or as a human being, he's got more of a British background. He's got a, a variety of mixture in his background. But um, for some reason, it's like, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, Renaissance lands neck. And um, the, the thing is, is that the, the British have actually, their, their influence in this, t in this period of time was actually a lot of um, Spanish and French had a lot of influence on the uh, English court. But if you look at Henry VIII's, this is basically Henry VIII period. There was also German influence in there too. Um, just like with all things that, that come from England, um, there is a lot, a mixture of a lot of different cultures that come with the British Isles. So so it's like, I, I can get away with Flynn being dressed in a bit of a, um, a slashed leather and, and uh, that, that lands neck influence and I, I can I can still get away with saying yeah it's kind of British it's 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 Renaissance um, Northern Europe there was a lot of mixture of of where the influences came from um, so it's like I can I can I can fake it a little bit let's face it um, we're we're modernists so it's like we're faking it anyways I mean they were faking it all the way it's one of the things um, one of my favorite uh, periods of uh, painting were the the Edwardian romantics where they would have you know the the big idea of the knights and chivalry and um, a reawakening of um, Arthurian legend was around the Edwardian period because um, you know they they thought of the knights and chivalry when um, Let's face it, if you really look back at the history of knights, they were not nice people. They, <laughs> they were actually pretty brutish, and the only chivalry that existed 
was among their own kind. And it, it's funny, but knights everywhere at the same period of time, if you go to um, the 16th century Japan or, or, or China or India or Asia, anywhere in Asia, it's kind of the same thing. They all had like their, their military um, people that, that stood above everybody else and they all had their own codes for within their group. So um, I'm going to try put, putting my, my paper under my hand again here so I'm not smearing so much. Um, so what I'm doing right now is we've already drawn these marvelous pencil lines here to get an idea of where the slashing is. And I'm putting in the slashing now. Um, again, because the pen ball doesn't roll as easily on the textured paper, there will be a buildup. It'll there will be some stopping at times, or where your pen will say, oh, "Okay, I don't want to work right now because I'm not rolling." And when it starts doing that, pull out your paper towel and just you know wipe it across the paper towel, and then it'll get going again. Or you know, t kind of conversely, take it on a piece of paper and just draw on just regular. This is like I said, this is a post-it note or um, sticky note or w whatever. Now I hate the fact that that a lot of these companies have their own personal copyright. Can't use it. It's kind of like the word Kleenex. You're not supposed to use Kleenex. Kleenex is a brand name. That's that's you're supposed to say facial tissue. So that you're not, you know, or popsicle. Believe it or not, popsicle is the name of a brand of an ice cream novelty. You know, depending on when you're using the term popsicle, you can only use popsicle if you're talking about popsicles. Ah, the joys of. I, I worked in publishing. I've worked in television. You have to be very careful sometimes. Now you'll notice sometimes I'm going outside the line. Say I, I this is the line that I want to draw on, and then I'm I'm allowing a little bit of skipping with my pen. And what that'll do is that it gives some interest. Some of this will be washed away, and some when I when I paint. And some of it will give some just some volume to the actual image that I'm drawing. So it's like I'm not worried about it being messy. I'm not worried about all the lines being in the right place. Um, it would show more if I were using uh, pen and ink. I've done both. I can do both. I, uh, I'll do a demonstration of just pen, um, India ink pen again. Because I, I I will use both mediums. I like both mediums, um, and both have their different qualities. It all depends on what you're trying to get with the medium you're using. What your what try type of personality do you want with the final product? And that's part of what you get when you're using um, ballpoint pen rather than using, um, say, India ink. Now, right now, right here, I've, I've got too much graphite on the page. I mean, I drew the line too thickly. And what's happening is, is that the pen and the graphite are competing for staying on the paper there. So sometimes you want to, again, ghost back or erase back the, the pencil line. The only problem with this be a little bit careful um, when you've just laid down fresh ballpoint pen because you're erasing it back with your kneaded eraser can smear the ink sometimes and you'll get a feel for when you you've overdone that and just gonna put it in the line here and I want to do something with um, his shirt. I'm thinking to add some extra lines in here, but I'm not sure where it, you can tell I'm going to draw over the top of that drum line and I want some slashing in here. Hmm. Do 
do I want it to go down there? Yeah, I think I want it to go down here. So I'm giving, I want to see, give, feel where that's going to go on the shirt. So I'm putting it on in pencil and then I'm going to put in, on, in pen because I didn't calculate that first. So I want to go back in with the pencil because the pencil can be totally erased. Whereas once I put it down with pen, I, it's, it, it can still be lifted up, but um, I have to, to damage the paper to do so. So it's always better, you know, it's like, okay, pencil is the thing that, you know, you can make mistakes with. Now I can go in, I've put down that information, and I'm going to go back in with my kneaded eraser, ghost it back a bit, get my pen cleaned up here. And now I'm going to go in and put the pen line in. And that's because, you know, it's like I'm not brave enough and I'm not secure enough that I would know how that I was going to do that just the way I wanted to if I went in with just the pen. So I'm going to, you know, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, that's cheating, you know. Um, there's no such thing as cheating in art. <laughs> it's, it's. Well, I, I shouldn't say there's no such thing as cheating. If you're stealing from somebody else, then nah, that can be considered cheating. But um, now I'm going to do a little bit of the drum. The drum has got, okay, the, 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 um, these tighten the, um, the, uh, there's like a lip on the drum here and they don't quite go around. Um, I like to, just as a point, try to get things as realistic as possible if I can. Like if there's a real reason for um, a drum to be designed a particular way, um, I will try to do it accurately because I know there's somebody out there who plays the drum and if I don't do it correctly at, or I don't do it somewhat correctly, they'll look at it and go, you didn't do that right. You, you, you don't know anything about playing the drum. You didn't design that right. You didn't draw that right. You, you have no respect for people who play drums. And so that, <laughs> I, I'm a real, I don't always do things right. But I always try to have my audience in mind. I always like to have, it's like, if I'm doing an airplane, dang it all, I'm going to try to do that, that airplane as realistically and as accurately as possible because there are people out there who that is important to. Um, you don't know how many people are out there who they see what you've drawn or they see that piece of art that you've created. And if you don't take into concern their, the thing that is important to them, they'll catch it every time. And uh, it's especially, it's, it's like I, I always say, I never want to do a train. Oh, please let me never have to do, draw a train. Because train people know their trains. And if you do a train wrong, man, they'll nail you. They will nail you. I have been around trade people. Though. They didn't do that, right? The boiler isn't there. That piece of equipment isn't there. I'll, I'll, but I, I like to take into consideration, you know, the people who are out there who do these sort of things. So it's like when I'm drawing something like this drum and I have some accurate information that I can look at because this tightening of that lip makes the drum sound differently and it, how you tighten or loosen this the stuff on the drum will make it work in a different way so it, it, it's like if I can make it look right somebody who plays the drum will you know one day look at that and go hey she either plays the drum or oh she takes in consideration of the fact that I play the drum so it's when you can try to take into consideration the uh, the people that that uh, you you are are drawing this for or who are going to look at your your work because they they will know whether or not 
you were looking at a real drum when you drew this or were you were paying attention to what was there and they will know that you either had interest in what they're interested in or they'll appreciate the fact that you actually took the time to really look at the thing you were drawing. And also it helps you learn about things that you may have never considered were important. Um, it's really important like when drawing an engine or drawing an automobile or um, if you don't know what you're looking at, try to do it as closely as you can to whatever reference material you've got because there will be somebody out there who will appreciate the fact that you took the time to try to do it correctly. Okay, what you're looking at is basically I've put in about, oh, I'd say two and a half hours since we um, did the head here and the front part of um, Flynn's body. Um, it yeah, puts some extra detail in his sleeves, an extra detail here. We finished up the drum and his legs, and I've done the other dragon's heads. And I did all this detail, of course, in the necks and the body. Although the, the body, I was telling you that I was thinking about doing the snake-like body, and um, did more work in the tail. I've done a little bit of racing the pencil way, but not much. Because um, what I want to do is um, show you what I wanted to do with this part of the wing here and this part of the body. And then I want to erase away the pencil and just to show you um, what I'm doing. Now, mind you, um, I've let this sit. Not only did I do about two and a half more hours of work on the inking, um, I've also let it sit overnight. So the thing is, is that most of the ink is dry now. And like I said, in dark places, wherever you've heavied up the ink, like in the corner of the eye here, um, or um, uh, one of the things I might want to show you is how to get, like there's this really big blob of ink that I put on the horn here. And it doesn't match some of the, the areas around um, the rest of the drawing. But the other thing is, is um, that is an area that I'm going to be painting. So I probably want to erase that now. What I might do too is after I get done with the entire painting, I will go over this entire drawing again with ink to heighten areas, to darken areas. Um, watercolor has, I'm going to be using a combination of probably watercolor and acrylic. I haven't decided yet. In the next um, video, we'll know, you'll know for sure whether you're playing with acrylic or we're playing with straight watercolor. Um, but the thing is, is that um, the mistakes that I make here can always be fixed at the end. And it's the, the end thing you do is after you've finished up all that painting, you put polish on it. But at the present, I want to finish up this bit of the leg because I want to show you, this is, wing is going to be somewhat transparent. You know, he's, this is going to have n nothing um, behind it per se. I'm going to put a little bit of abstract background behind this. Um, it's not going to be a real background. It's going to be more color and texture than it is going to be a um, defined background so that the, the subject matter is here and it's just, it'll be put there for added interest. But I want this wing to be transparent and I want you to be able to see his leg through that transparency. But I don't want to have this leg have as much detail as per se um, this leg back here. So I'm going to do it a little bit lighter and I won't be putting as much detail in it so you can see what I'm talking about. So I'm going to try to focus my camera in on that. There we go. Now sometimes these things work and sometimes they don't. I'm, I'm still um, getting better with my video. It's, it's trial and error. I, I'm enjoying doing this and having you come and watch me. Um, and it's all experiment. And that's, that's our artwork in general. I mean, when we're creating, um, it's always a learning process. I mean, especially for someone like me. Um, I've been around a while. Um, 
and I started these the the tools I'm working with now the pens the paper um, watercolor these are things that I've been playing with for years and they're familiar to me when I get on the computer I've been working with computer for actually a long time now too but there's always a new program I'm, I'm learning blender now I'm learning um, 3d on the computer as well and every time you try something new it's that that all new learning curve but also when you're doing a new painting every time even though you're using the same materials and the same tools everything that you do um, it's always a new learning experience a new beginning and so it, it's a never-ending um, situation it's it, and here's the thing too um, as I've gotten older, my eyesight's gotten worse. I had, you know, like perfect eyesight, and then I got glasses. So the thing is, is that I'm having to learn to work with glasses now. Um, I'm expecting arthritis. Arthritis is in my family, so, you know, it's like I might not have the use of my hands in the same way. So we have only this limited time in this planet to express ourselves. So, you know, that's that's part of the thing too is how, how, how many paintings can I get in before an automobile hits me because it's like honestly we're we're only here for a short time and accidents happen so it's 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 like I'm I'm, I'm a good one for um living every day as best I can and enjoying it and doing these videos is one of those you know, I'm, I, I'm going to be drawing and painting this anyways. Maybe I can share what I know with somebody else and you can learn something by watching me or maybe you enjoy listening to my voice or um, something along those lines. And I'm enjoying making this. And that's, that's what this communication is all about, our sharing our artwork um, together online which is kind of cool and never got to do that um when i first started posting vid videos i had another channel a long time ago and it would take all day to load up like a one minute video and now you can load up an hour in a couple of hours it's it's kind of amazing but right now as i'm, I'm going through this you can tell i'm doing everything really lightly i'm using the fine pen rather than the big stick and I'm just, I'm just very, very, the lightest of lightest touches putting down this, this ink work so that you can, when it gets done, you'll feel that leg totally coming through, but it won't stand out and you'll feel that his, his, um, wing is transparent, like, um, a thin layer that you can see through and, um, it's funny, um, there was another artist who did a lot of dragons who, he does these really big, heavy, robust dragons, and you can believe that they'll, they can fly with the wings that they've got. And mind you, this, this guy has kind of bat wings, but it's like, again, you know, you never know. He's got light bones. Um, how do birds fly? They, if, if you ever pick up a bird body, they're pretty light. They, um, bats bodies, they're lightweight. You know, how would a dragon fly? Um, you know, maybe they have helium in their, their system so that even if they're very heavy boned, they have a helium sac somewhere so that, so that it, it elevates their ability to fly and they don't have to flap their wings as much, you know. You can always make up your dragon biology. And that's the other thing. If, if you want to study art, also study biology. If you're, you're creating things, you kind of want to study a little bit of everything. If you're, if you're, um, I'm doing, um, a steampunk comic right now and it, it helps to know, um, how steam engines work. It helps to know, um, how machines work. If you're going to be drawing, um, uh, uh, odd, uh, inventions in, um, your situation, um, it always helps to get reference. I have a huge library I've been building up my entire life of pictorial reference of all kinds of things. Okay, now I don't have his scales delineated back there, so I'm going to pull out my pencil again. And we're going to, again, do the diagonals. Just 
So I'm doing lines across this tail and I'm again pulling them a bit around the tail so you get, get volume. So it, you think about like a barber pole so you can get uh, some extra volume in it. So you're going to do it in a curve. It's not a straight line across. It's more a little bit of a, a curve. And you're thinking about, like I said, I'm, I'm thinking about di a diamond area in the center of each one of those lines. There, so I've set up my my basic shape for for this. I'll go back to the the fine line rather than a, a thick again. And I'm just I'm very lightly putting an oval in each one of those squares, and that all of this both the pencil and the ink line some of it will be taken back when i start painting you won't be able to see it um and then that's why when i'm completely done with painting i will go in again and heavy up any lines that need to be heavied up um, crisp and up detail that's been lost by the pigment and you'll find if you're if you're doing an illustration if you're doing a drawing um, you will redraw your drawing at least three to five times the whole thing sometimes about three to five times in the process of doing the piece um, and it's just because you cover up things that you decided you didn't want anymore in the composition or you've buried things under pigment or you've buried things under paint and then you have to rework them up again. Um, what I like to do is when I'm done with this I'm pro I will print out, um, I'm going to scan this before I paint it um, because I also I like to have a coloring book page because um, since I do very linear work underneath my paintings and I do a lot of line work and this is a line work. Um, I like to have something that, that I can basically eventually use as a coloring book page. So I will Xerox it for the, or Xerox it, sorry, um, copy it, scan it for that reason. Um, and I also will scan it because it's nice to have the original drawing to look at when I do, if I do over cover things with, um, with the uh, paint and I want to see where I start what I started with or I want something for reference so that's always a nice thing to have I'm gonna have his his uh, his scales overlapping them here so I'm gonna put these like little diagonals and what I'll probably do is I'm going to really do detail this out a little bit more in here when I get done. I want to give him some more um, both volume and um, detail in there. So I'll probably um, put some more texture in these stomach scales um, before I'm completely finished. But that's... That's about all I want to do with this right now. Um, here, I'm going to give him a little bit uh, for my pencil over here. Let's see, is that in the... Yeah, you can see what I'm doing. Sorry. <laughs> I'm double checking my camera so you can see what I'm doing. Um, but mind you, this is going to be technically out of frame of... Again, I cut this in for so it would have an inch inward but I'm thinking I'm gonna paint the whole thing out to the edge and then that way you can put in a, like a quarter inch mat around it the people that I'm gonna give this to they can put a quarter inch mat around it so that the the actual composition can go all the way out to the edges um, in this case that's that's what I'm doing with it just I, I decided to do that after the fact and the thing is is that that's okay you can decide to do things after after the fact. You know, sometimes people feel that you know they do something and they ha what the the decision that they made has to be set in stone. And it's like it doesn't. You can change your mind. Now again, that's because I, I should reiterate that's because I am the art director on this piece. If you are doing a piece for a client, 
if you are doing a piece for a company, um, you might not have that much freedom um, because, again, I'm doing this for myself. And I get, I, that's what an art director is. An art director says, okay, I want this, 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 and this. And there may be areas that you're completely free in. I have some, I've had some art directors who, okay, my pen isn't rolling again. And it's the wrong pen too, because I'm using this one. <laughs> um, but I've had art directors who give me complete freedom and say, do whatever you want. And I have, um, clients where you're going, I want exactly A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and um, you have to follow it to the T, and there's not a lot of freedom to it, but you find the freedom in the creation of the piece itself. I mean, there, there's always a piece of freedom somewhere in everything you do. Um, I work in animation. Animation is strictly teamwork. Um, you're do, working on somebody else's characters. You're working on somebody else's script. But you get to set up the shots. You get to set up the acting within the script. You get to set up the emotion. There's, there's all kinds of places to be creative in that. So it, 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 um, whenever you're doing any kind of active or, um, creation, you still have a lot of freedom in what you're doing. Okay, now I'm going to... Um, expand the camera out again so we can actually let, let me do it um, uh, more closely here okay you can see there's a lot of pencil under this area where this head is and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my kneaded eraser and take the initial pencil off with the kneaded eraser because I've put a lot of pencil under the drawing because again I've roughed out right on the paper so there's a lot of pencil here right now so I'll start off with the kneaded eraser, and that'll pick up most of the pencil. Um, I'm going to pull this down because I'm going to show you one more thing I'm going to show you too. And then you'll go in with your latex eraser, and that'll get the rest of it. So if you want to get all the pencil off of there so you don't have anything but your ink line, this will that that'll get the rest of it and then if you want to go back in with the kneaded eraser one more time and then the latex eraser so you can go, go back and forth until you've gotten those two things will get most of your pencil line off now what I do want to show you let's bring it up just a little more here Okay. And then the thing is, is that once I go in with the um, the watercolor, whether it's watercolor or liquid acrylic, um, that'll even take things back further. Okay, the next thing I want to show you, I just want to show you, this This is um, heavy, really heavy up in the ink area here. What I'm going to do, this is an X-Acto knife blade. You can also use um, um, your standard... Uh, utility knife blade works. Um, anything with a razor type of an edge, you can actually use a razor blade. Scalpel knife, oh my god, um, they're really sharp. In Europe, they don't use exacto knives, they use scalpel knife blades. Um, but anyways, what I did was I s very, very gently, let me do that again, sliced across kind of the area that I want to uh, take away and then I'm just really carefully um, scraping the paper away it's like you want to use the flat of the knife you're not you're trying not to use as much of the tip you're using more of the flat of the blade and you're pushing into the paper to scrape it away so you, you think about I always think about it it's like um, my standard um, example is it's like you're sanding it away like with sandpaper and you take it down to where you can see there there's um, residue from my scraping it away just like if you're you're uh, sanding a piece of wood you're gonna have chips wood chips you get these this little bit of residue of paper 
Then take your kneaded eraser, wad it up a bit, and then erase it away. Then take your, your uh, rubber eraser and you smooth that down. And what that does is that, that takes the fibers, the excess fibers, away from the paper. Okay? And then there's a little bit of a ridge of paper here. And I'm just going to shave that away. And you want to keep shaving this down until you've got as flat a paper as possible. And what the, the racer does is that it pulls up the remaining fibers that are there. Okay. And then when you're going in with the latex, that basically burnishes the remaining fibers down. So the thing is, is that when you come back in with your watercolor, um, there might be a little residue around here, but for the most part, it, there won't be any residue there and you can't, can barely see it. Now you can tell, I, I had this one little area right here of white. Real tough. Jeez, then we bring back in the pen. And that's it. Or like, this is, um, I don't like the way this stuff's sticking out here. I'm gonna take this back, I'm gonna erase this away. So this is literally, you're, you're, you're erasing away the ink just as if you were using just the eraser. But because the ink has um, embedded itself into a layer of paper, you've got to get rid of the layer of paper where the ink has embedded itself. And that's why you have to come in with a knife blade. And the thing is, is that because this is really good paper with really good size, that will barely even show once you paint over it. And if you're just doing black and white, I mean, you can take down that, that, that little layer of paper. Nobody will ever notice that you have made a mistake. And the real key to this is just be gentle. I mean, you know, shave it very gently. Um, if you're afraid of doing this to a piece that you want to keep, make them, you know, Intentionally take a piece of paper, pick a scrap piece of paper, and again, it's got to be good paper. If you're doing this on really thin paper, it's not going to work. This is a 140 pound or 300 gram paper. It's thick. It's 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 almost Bristol thick. You can do this with Bristol. Um, you can do this with good watercolor paper. Uh, I wouldn't do it. Um, with any less than like 90 pound paper. I mean, you can try. I mean, if, if, you, if you've made a mistake and it's really bad and you're really not happy with it, or like, see, here's a blob. Remember I was talking about ballpoint pens blob? And I like some of the blobs, like here we have, have little blobs everywhere that give it kind of speckles. You know, here's, there's speckles in his, in his, um, in his scales and it, it gives it um, some personality. So I like the blobs occasionally. But say I didn't want that blob there, again, I can just you know, carefully, this has been, this is cured overnight. And again, I mean, you can start doing this probably an hour or two after you've made the mistake. And I'm just gonna scrape that little blob away. And if I, say I've painted, I'll, I can show this to you when I finish the painting too. Say I've, I've got that blob there and I've painted over there. I can scrape that down to the white and I can show you ways of touching up the paint. So you wouldn't even know that I touched up the paint in that area. And that's the thing with, with anything that you're doing in art. Um, learn how to fix your mistakes because you're going to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And it's not about um, making the mistakes. It's about knowing how to go back in and fix them because they're just going to happen. And you don't want to throw away an entire painting or a entire drawing just because you made one little mistake. So you just learn how to fix your mistakes. I'm just putting that away a little bit more. Okay. And that's how you fix a mistake with pen and ink and paper. And again, um, I'm going to go over this entire piece and erase 
give it a really good cleaning and erase away all the, the pencil line. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to paint this baby. Thank you very much for stopping by. Thank you, through, thank you for sitting through this very long video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I gave you some information that you can use on your next piece. Um, oh, let me real fast. Uh, let's see here. Let me show you. Uh, bring up one more. And one more thing. I loved, um, if you ever watched Jackie Chan Adventures, um, it's a, a cartoon series that was done in the 90s. And there was a character called Uncle, and he always said, and one more thing. It's the story of my life, and one more thing. Okay, here's the leg that's supposed to be underneath the wing. And I think I might have detailed it just a little much, but once I put, uh, put the uh, paint over the top of it, there we go. So you can see the, the difference between the detailing that I did on this leg and this one. So I kept it a little bit lighter in the background. Now what I might do, um, I might go over that with my razor blade, the flat of the razor blade, just so that um, it comes through a little bit lighter so that not all that detail shows. All right, I'll blow this up again so you. And normally, um, <laughs> I use my hand. I'm. Like I said, you can use um, a brush or um, they have feathers in, in Japan. They use um, a wing to brush the, the, um, the dust off their, their uh, drawing. But that's, that is our, basically our finished um, base drawing in ballpoint pen. And uh, thank you for stopping by. Again, my name is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. All my links are down um, in the information below. And please stop by again to see the finish on this. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.